Welcome to the Eat Y'all podcast, where we discuss the struggles and successes of the farmers, food producers, and chefs who are working to get better ingredients into restaurants today and to ensure their availability in the future. This episode of the Eat Y'all podcast is made possible through a partnership with the Kentucky Beef Council, an organization working for the cattle producers of Kentucky in areas of promotion, education, and research. Learn more at kybeef.com. That's kybeef.com. Welcome back to the Eat Y'all podcast. Andy Chapman, your host here with Mariana. We are going through this beef series one week at a time. And man, this has been a rich episode. Thanks, Andy. I think this has been a great season so far. I've heard a lot of amazing feedback on these beefy episodes, and I'm really excited to get back to Kentucky in this particular episode with the farms and chefs that you visited last month. That's right. So we did the Around the Farm last week. This week, we are on site, meaning I'm sitting in our friend Justin Thompson's restaurant, Local Feed in Georgetown, Kentucky. And I got to say, it was a real treat to record live in their dining room and eat the lunch that Justin cooked with meat from Halstead Farms. And guys, we'll have some photos on that. But Extra special shout out and thank you to Justin and his whole crew at Local Feed. Got to hang out with some of them for his birthday the day before. Justin was really kind to host us for the podcast and cook us lunch. It was epic. And there's some great pictures of that. As well. I saw those pictures. It looks like I really missed out. So I hate I missed that trip. But let's set this episode up. One of the things that Justin talks about is hiring dishwashers. So interesting divergence from the beef farming operation. But I think that every chef should listen to this segment. And it's one of the best strategies for filling positions I've heard. And I mean, man, we always talk about how farms and restaurant operations kind of overlap. And I don't think that's ever been more true than right now with the the hiring crisis that we're hearing about literally around the globe when it comes to hospitality industry and the farming industry who are having trouble getting in folks to work on the farms too. So yeah, definitely check out that clip in this episode. I loved that. Well, yeah, totally. And every single, and I do mean every single chef I've talked to in probably about the last 18 months has been discussing how tricky it's been to find labor for various positions. So be looking for that nugget with Justin and the dishwasher, and we will jump into the show with Chef Johnny Streetman, Justin Thompson, and farmer Amanda Hall from Halstead Farms. It's going to be a good one. Welcome to the Eat Y'all podcast. I'm your host, Andy Chapman, and it is a lot of fun to be able to be sitting here in Georgetown, Kentucky, which is, uh, what, about 15, 20 minutes from Lexington? 11 miles from downtown, so yeah, depends on how you drive. <laughs> that, that's very true. It does does kind of depend on how you drive. And uh, so I'm joined by Chef Justin Thompson, Chef uh, Johnny Streetman. Spelled just like that right? sounds, street man. Street man. And farmer Amanda Hall. It's great to great to be with you guys. We just spent a couple hours out on the the farm, and it's called Halstead Farm, right? It is. Yes, it is called Halstead Farms. Uh, we came up with the name because our last name is Hall, um, but we kind of like the homestead, but called it Halstead. So just a, a play on words there. I like it. Well, it's a it's a beautiful farm outside of Georgetown. So we're going to talk about beef. We're going to talk about restaurants. We're going to talk about some of the challenges that face different parts of the industry and how the two kind of go together. But first, I want if y'all will go ahead and just kind of tell us a little bit about your, Justin, we're in your restaurant here, Local Feed. Tell us about how you got here and, and what Local Feed is for the listeners. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to welcome everybody. It's always good to see Andy and having the Eat Y'all crew. Always good having the Beef Council here. Johnny's an old friend of mine. Pleasure to meet local farmers always. From there, uh, just hit my 40, 40th birthday last week and uh, been doing this full time since I was 15. Never done anything else. I walked away from doing it for other people about seven years ago. Decided to become a restaurateur, if you will, and built this one uh, we actually are hitting our sixth year next month and it's been it's been a roller coaster it's it's one thing to be a chef it's one thing to have your own establishment to say that i i love it would be an understatement and it's it's the passion of my life i love everything about it love the people i work with love the people i meet 
We're here at Georgetown, Central Kentucky, like you said, about 15 minutes outside of Lexington, right on both interstates, 64 and 75. If you're ever passing through, come see us. And describe your kind of genre. I just call it good. Uh, well, when I when I walked away from restaurants, if you want to call it white tablecloth, that's that's the only thing that I had ever done. So high end white tablecloth style service and food. It was hard for me to kind of take a step back from that, but I moved to my hometown, which is Georgetown, and uh, I wanted to make something that I spent my my summers cooking with my grandmother and what I knew that people in this town would be comfortable going out to eat on a regular basis, but doing it at a tier that was technique wise the same that I'd been doing for 20 years. I didn't want to lose that. Um, so it's very approachable and very recognizable things just done at an elevated level. Uh, a lot of Southern food, a lot of comfort food. We still get wild and do fun stuff with specials. A huge thing that we do is, is whole animal breakdowns and just the way that we sell beef. We don't we don't buy cuts. We buy cows. I buy a whole Wagyu beef every two weeks. Like I said, it's been a pleasure getting to learn more about a local farm today that does the same thing. That's pretty much where I'm at. Yeah, that's awesome. And maybe later we'll get into this, but I, you know, I don't think every chef knows how many of what come on a cow. So you know exactly how many pounds of oxtail you get with a cow not very much you can make one pot of soup (laughs) yeah that's pretty cool all right so next up johnny streetman and johnny uh johnny became johnny on the spot when uh we reached out to phil and came highly recommended as someone who would be a great chef to bring out to the farm and uh, so johnny tell us about lex chef yeah, well, uh, thank you for having me. Lex Chef is my partner and I, Sean Rice. It's our uh, personal chef endeavor. We've both worked in restaurants for years and years. And in the past couple of years, we just started to get more and more opportunities to come into people's homes, smaller gatherings, cook a three-course meal paired with wine and uh, and all that good stuff and it's just kind of kind of just taken off from there so we're at a really nice place right now that allows us to continuously be creative and uh, change up the menu a lot and you know not nearly as cool as anything justin does but maybe one day i'll be as i'll be as cool as that guy we're all hoping for that yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, he's he's the man but yeah that's that's basically it you know i i I'm 34. I did the I did the restaurant scene for 15 years or so, and uh, you know loved it, learned a lot, but just kind of got this opportunity and got really excited about it and ran with it, and here we are. The way you run Lex Chef as opposed to like a, a full on restaurant. Are there some lifestyle benefits to, to that as well for you personally? Absolutely. I'm a father of two now, so. You know, a lot of chefs, they don't get to be around the house as much as they want to be and started having kids. So knew I wanted to uh, change things up a little bit. And that has definitely allowed me to be around the house more. I'm not gone every single night. It's it's great. It's it's a, it's definitely less stress as well. Yeah. Then, uh, you know, doing two, three hundred covers a night and as opposed to. 12 covers <laughs> <laughs> well and you're talking about not being around the house justin is literally around the house or around the kitchen yeah. all the time because yeah. of the proximity he's, he's got a, he's got a so, sweet, sweet setup yeah that's that's really neat how that worked out so um, amanda you're you're a beef farmer i am yes talk talk to us about um, your your family history and i know you're multi-generations in now and you're raising another generation of farmers tell folks kind of your story and how you got here yeah sure um like andy said i'm a multi-generational beef farmer so you know my my grandpa farm my great-grandpa farm my dad he's a farmer himself and kind of passed it along to me um i grew up in 4-h and ffa showing cattle and working with my sae project we kind of branched out into doing feeder steers which we still do today but feeder steers is kind of the middle area between the cow calf operation and when cattle go out west of the feed yard so every summer what i would do and continue to do is we purchase a group of feeder steers and run them all summer long on grass and we would practice rotational grazing we would get them bigger and then sell them in the fall time and so kind of 
learning the business that way and while working with my dad and kind of learning how the feedlots out west operates with the cattle producers, you know, east of the Mississippi and kind of how the whole supply chain works, I was able to really see the whole scope of the beef industry and how every, you know, cattle farmer, cattle producer plays a role in the end product. Talk more about kind of that. We, we talked earlier on the farm. You pointed to um, a row of, I don't know how many steers were, were out there. Would you say 100 or so were out there? Around and, 140, give or take. Okay. And and you said uh, this is a, uh, you know, these are going to a feedlot. These are, quote, factory farms. And we kind of laughed because we're standing in a, you know, a beautiful Kentucky hillside. But talk about the 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 process from the beginning of the the life cycle to the plate where we just you know destroyed some <laughs> some, some beef delicious that Justin, beef. Yes. Justin made amazing for us. So what we do, and especially my off farm job as well, it's a cattle brokerage company. So I'm kind of able to be part of the animal's life cycle, kind of from beginning till processing. And so you have first the the cow calf operation and over 99% of all the beef cattle come from a family farm. And people don't realize that in Kentucky, the average herd size is only 27 head. And when you all were on our farm, we had 53 cows. So we're twice as big on that farm than the average Kentucky farmer. So what people don't realize is that all their beef is essentially family managed, family grown, family raised. It's just that cattle producers trying to do their best to take it to the next level. And what I meant by kind of a factory farm is because they're trying to do a head per acre or a head per square foot, you know, and how we're able and running our farm and how a lot of people do the beef network and also the beef council. They're great with you know, teaching us beef farmers how to maximize our farms and be better producers, more efficient with rotational grazing and better management. We run a lot of cattle on a farm, but you all were there. It's a big, huge open field. And those cattle, they are happy as can be. There's plenty of grass. There's grass in the field next to them. They have food for days. So it's kind of cool to be able to see every step from the cow calf to them growing up to the backgrounding steers. And then what we do and what producers in Kentucky is they'll sell their beef or their cattle at the stockyards. And so those local producers then their cattle then get shipped out to the feed yards where the feed yards are also family owned, family operated. And then the feed yards, they take them to the next level and get them a little bit larger, better for processing, better for eating. And then that's when they go to the processors. So you guys are kind of integrated into that whole thing from your your family from kind of day one. You understand that side of the business probably more than most folks, I would imagine. Yeah, probably so, I'd say, because it's people think it's all um, large corporations, but it's not. It's people out West, you know, they're trying to raise it with their family. They're multi-generational as well. Our family feedlots that we work with a lot out West. And people think it's all these large corporations, but it's just like your family trying to do the best they can. Yeah. And and a a lot of what I'm I'm also hearing is the relationships between, you know, they want to know where their cows are coming from and that they're buying the best they can get. And talk about the state of Kentucky. What I know it's a it's a big beef producing state. Is it the largest on this side of uh, the, the Mississippi. Mississippi River? Yep, it's the largest beef cattle state. We finally beat Tennessee a couple of years ago, so uh, there are over a million. Is it a million? Yes. So Kentucky's home. We'll, we'll like bring Caitlin Hawkins in for the for the quick tips here. Yes. Fast facts. Kentucky is home to over 38,000 beef farmers, and we raise over 2 million head of cattle here in our state. Wow. Yep. Huge, big industry, and we're really fortunate to have a number of farm families across our state that their whole goal is to provide a high-quality protein for consumers, but doing it in a safe and wholesome manner and putting 
truly putting the animal first because without that healthy animal, then there's no true beef industry. And without a chef and a consumer to purchase that and cook it and consume it, there's also no beef industry. So huge cattle state, east of the Mississippi. We're really excited about it. And and not all the those cattle, like so many of them, leave the leave the state and do a little uh, do a little adventure before they end up on a plate. So, what what does that look like when they they load up? Like, how long does it take to get to where they go? Like, walk me through that. So, when they load up, a lot of cattle where I work, cattle can be transported around 600, 700 miles. Sometimes it even goes up to around 900, but they go pretty much to the corn belt. So you have Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa is a huge one. That's where the majority of your feedlots are. And so when cattle get loaded up, you know, we have a partnership worked out with a feed yard where then they get delivered. And then after they get delivered, They go through all their health checks. They make sure the cattle are healthy. They were transported well because that's a crucial thing for all of cattle owners is we want to make sure that our cattle are healthy. The trailers have the holes in the side of them to encourage airflow through there. We make sure our drivers stop periodically that everybody's standing up. Everybody looks healthy. You know, you make stops that the cattle can get water if they need to get offloaded if it's as hot as it is right now. So... We make sure that health is kind of first priority. And then once they get out to the feed yard, the owners there, they go through their health checks and then they start feeding them their rations and slowly building up their appetites where then they, you know, get to their finished weight. And then when they're there for about 60 days is when they then go over to the processors. And then after the processors, they can, they usually do a wet age with the, the box beef that goes to your Kroger's and your local grocery stores. And so it should be back probably, I'd say, to your local Kroger's in about a month time from processing. Wow. It's pretty quick. That's amazing. And that's from hundreds of uh, family farms all across the state. And exactly. Really, I guess, across the country, they're, they're doing this. That's really, uh, it's amazing. Well, um, so let's talk more about farming and chefing. One of the things that we talked about earlier uh, as we were kind of touring the farm, we were talking about days off and, and things like that. And uh, so what are some of the similarities, Johnny, that you see between what you've seen with a farm family and what you guys deal with day in and day out? You know, with the farm, you, there's always something that needs to be done. Always kind of, you know, especially in peak seasons, you always feel like you're behind and but, you know, Justin knows this just as well as any other talented chef. It's it's just always evolving. You're always thinking about what's next and what needs to be done. Just kind of never stops. But I think that's one of the things that whether you're a farmer or a chef, that's kind of one of the things you love about it. Never, never kind of slow down in a way. Do you think you'd pile on with that, Justin? Yeah, I think that um, just the farmer relationships in general is a, a great thing about my job, having them pull up to the back door, shaking their hand, seeing seeing what they have, hearing about what their week was like, kind of sharing our hardships and hearing their hardships. And like you said, the constant involvement of, of being a chef is, is the other half of it that we love. People say that it gets repetitive. It, it's not repetitive at all. Like, that's not the way it is. Every day is a different problem. Every day is a different issue. Every day is a different excitement. And the more you ride that the longer you can ride it. So uh, when you're selling beef out the back door that, that was your cow you raised, um, what kind of feedback do you get? What, what are people saying about why, why are they coming to you? People love the story. They love the story behind the beef. They love the story of the farm. They like to be able to see the farm that it came from because, uh, I think there's been a huge disconnect between the consumer and also the grocery store about where your food really comes from in the store. You know, I tell people, they say, wow, this is so much better than what we get at Kroger. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? We sell to Kroger too. Like our beef ends up there. Well, what are you talking about? Well, not every animal that we raise, we can sell locally because that would just be a ton of meat. But I was like, you know, all of our beef ends up 
at Kroger. It ends up, you know, at your Foster's or wherever, you know, but all the beef that is, you know, USDA and product of the USA, it comes from a family farm. So I think people love coming to us because they love a story. They like to be able to see the farmer. And also, you know, we do finish our beef out, grass fed, grain finished, and we take pride in what we do and we process it a certain way to where we think makes the most sense for our customer, where they can have, get the most bang for their buck. You know, instead of doing T-bones, we'll do the strip steak and the filet. So then they get, you know, two extra steaks as opposed to the one T-bone. So we try to think about what they want and provide it. And I, I think as a chef, you know, when you start to build those relationships with farmers, just makes such a huge impact on how you treat that you know whether it's um whether it's a side of beef or if it's just a bulb of garlic you know it's if you build that relationship and you can respect how hard the farmer works you know as opposed to just showing up in your you know big box deliveries there and then you go to you know go to work it's uh, it, it just makes a huge difference respecting the ingredient and how hard the farmer has has worked to get it to your kitchen yeah for sure. It, it, it is funny how there's there's so many parallels between the, the work that it takes in the kitchen to make something amazing happen on the plate and the same on the on the farm because you don't get days off when you're taking care of another, you know, another living thing. So that's amazing. We're going to get to the lightning round in a minute, but I want to know for, you know, you guys kind of start off on the chef side, but what's the biggest challenge that you face like right now this week? Like what's something that, that you're like, okay. Well, it's probably the first thing you're going to hear from anybody that you ask this question, staffing. (laughs) I think more people are eating out than ever have, not just here, not just there in general and less people are doing it. We're short staffed and bartending and serving and food running and cooks and the only thing I'm not short staffed in is dishwashers. Mm-hmm. I just hire every single one of them that comes through the door. But outside of that, kind of like I was saying a minute ago, it's a, a constantly evolving mess and things that you just have to fix and deal with. You can view that as something that makes you excited or something that burns you out, and it happens both ways to people all the time. I think just keeping keeping the level of excitement and love for what you do is the only thing that really keeps chef going. chefs going the way that they do. But, yeah, it's a, it's a constant issue, just running a restaurant in general. There's so many things, so many things that are coming up and breaking and need to be fixed and people's emotions and dealing with, you know, just problems constantly. People having feelings. It's so, <laughs> so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do with staffing? Like, you're shorthanded. You're still killing it. I've heard many stories about how many people are here on on a regular basis. What have you done to survive that? Honestly, I mean, I think of how I started working in restaurants, and I started, like I was saying, 25, 26 years ago when I started washing dishes. I was just saying a second ago that that's the only thing that I'm not short-staffed on just because there are so many people that are young or don't necessarily have a skill set yet in their life, and that's just the way that they start. So that's the one stack of applications that I always have. And when COVID started, chefs and experienced people kind of disappeared. And so the opportunity to even hire cooks is almost impossible. Just started hiring every single dishwasher, and the ones that are hungry get taught and move up. Now I've got a kitchen almost completely staffed with people that have been with me for a year, 15 months, 18 months, two years, and they've they've worked their way up the ladder, and it becomes something that's exciting for them because they've learned a skill set in life. It's They're no longer a dishwasher. You know, one of our uh, our mutual friends, Paco Garcia, yeah. started <laughs> dishwasher to uh, James Beard nominee. So I, I love that. I think that's so smart. It's like, high, like bringing people in the in the bottom and, and kind of like from the from the kind of the bottom of the barrel and just building them up mm-hmm. and, and helping them get somewhere greater I think is and that probably helps a tremendous amount with retention because they know there's more 
they're not stuck in that that spot, right? Yeah, yeah. I have a quote that I, I say all the time to my staff: "Be better than good at something." And it can be a day. A day turns into a week. A week turns into a month. A month turns into a year. And now you have a new career. Yeah, I think sometimes when you know, like for example, a dishwasher, when they could be younger, kind of in that transitional point in their life, kind of like what what do I really want to do, you know? And you get your foot in the door. And uh, for me, at least, you know, and a lot of other chefs, it's easy to get addicted. You know, there's the buzz, there's the adrenaline. So it can kind of just blossom from there, you know? So Johnny on, you know, everybody kind of nodded on staffing. Do you have any, anything that's like one of your, like, this is a big pain point for me right now challenge? Not nearly as much as Justin. <laughs> I'm more like in the mindset. Everything's so perfect right now as far as produce goes. I'm kind of just thinking about that timeline. You know, how how much longer can I get the opportunity to utilize all this great stuff? Right, because you're buying and whatever's fresh and ready, not just... It, exactly. Yeah. How about you, Amanda? What, what's the biggest challenge facing Halstead? I would probably have to agree with these guys is trying to find people who uh, want to work because, you know, my husband, he works full time on the farm and, you know, I have a job off of the farm, but, you know, I'm still out there every day, you know, getting a couple things knocked off the to-do list. But, you know, when you're in the peak seasons with hay and grain and planting time, um, you don't, you never have enough help, but it's, it's really hard and challenging to find people who are willing to do the the hard hot work but you know besides that everything usually goes pretty good the markets sometimes are hard because it's so volatile it's kind of like the guys in the restaurant business you're dependent on people coming in and with us we're dependent on the markets being favorable for us so because when it's time to sell it's time to sell and hopefully things are where you need them to be oh yeah what's the equivalent of the dishwasher position on a farm What's the if I if I was walking up to apply today, what would I be doing? If you really want to start at the bottom, I'd say weed eating, and weed eating's a tough job. It takes a really tough person to do that. But for the most part, if if you're doing hay, raking hay, sitting on a tractor, maybe bush hogging, which is mowing the field, so there's pretty much there's always a task to be done. Yeah, you never run out of. You don't sit around with a checked off to-do list ever, do you? Never, but that's okay. My my first job out of high school was working for a landscape company, and they had me weed eat two miles up and two miles back on this office park, and then edge two miles up, two miles back, and then below two miles up and two miles back. I appreciate landscapers and the work that that takes on a, on a level I've never imagined. It was awful. It was good work, but man, that that's hard. It is. And fences are the worst because you got to go around every post. We spray our fences. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Hi, everyone. It's Mariana, and let's talk beef for just a minute. It's been informative and eye-opening to visit beef operations with chefs over the past couple of years, And that all started with our friends at the Kentucky Beef Council. One thing we've learned is that a lot of thought and care goes into raising beef with superior flavor, texture, and nutrition. I want to put the best in my body in terms of flavor and nutrition, and I bet you do too. Hopefully these episodes help you be confident to choose beef more often. Thoughtfully sourcing your food makes a big difference to your health and to the sustainability of producers like those in the Kentucky Beef Council who work hard every day to bring only the best to your plate. All right, so we're going to uh, kind of transition into a little bit of a lightning round, kind of get a little bit more in-depth on on these guys. And Justin's probably, you may have done a little lightning round in the past. I can't remember. We'll check the uh, check the tape and see if his answers have changed or not. But um, we'll start off with, with you, Johnny. Biscuits or cornbread? Cornbread. Cornbread. Do you have a reason for that, or are you just you're just... It's a tough call, but I don't know. Just always grew up on it. Could eat it every day. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner. There you go. How about you, Justin? 
the same time together. <laughs> I can't make that choice. There's no way. It's two of my favorite things. <laughs> It is that is a tough one. That is. A I'd say a local feed. I like the biscuits. Cornbread's still delicious, but I don't know. I had the biscuits a couple weeks ago, and it just they hit the spot. Can't hit biscuits. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Did you? I feel like you may have made some biscuits at Chef Camp. One I feel time. like I did. I feel like that's a true story. I feel like that was a. I feel like I, I was a winner there, getting some of that. What's your favorite cut of beef? I love a good flank steak. Flank steak. Probably ribeye. I'm going Denver. Going the Denver. Explain for uh, for everybody what a Denver cut is, Justin. One of the many muscles that comes out of the chuck. You have to know what you're doing to find it. You have to know what you're doing to cut it. If you're lucky enough to have it, it's delicious. So if you go into a grocery store and there's a huge chuck roast, there's a Denver steak in there. Is that right? Probably not in the chuck roast. You would have to buy the chuck roll. The chuck roll. Yeah. It backs, it backs up next to the brisket. Caitlin's over there. She knows She knows exactly where it is and how to find it. That's, oh, so it backs up to the brisket. See, learning, learning new things every day. Who is your hero in, in kind of what you do and, and like who do you look for is like I want to emulate this person with what I'm doing well we've kind of taken a lot of kind of advisors over the years and listening to the older generations and learning from them but as typical as it sounds I think my dad he's been a huge supporter of our investment in the cattle industry I mean he's one who started from you know, scooping trailers, you know, every single week at the stock. That sounds like the dishwasher job. Yeah, scooping trailers at the stockyards. So now we're hill ship, you know, 30 some loads of cattle per week. And so it really is starting from the ground up and teaching us pretty much almost everything he knows and trying to help us out. So he's been a huge supporter for us. That's awesome. Johnny? Justin Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be my answer. <laughs> I've just been re-inspired watching him chef it up in the kitchen. So, this guy's amazing. Thanks, bud. <laughs> Love you, man. I'd have to say for me, um, everybody has their their famous chefs that they grew up reading about and reading their books and reading their words. And But for me, it probably has to be the one that taught me, Jonathan Lundy, chef in Lexington. I spent the first 12 years in, my, in this industry working for him in multiple restaurants Finally, he opened his own place, helped him open that place, and spent 10 years with him there. Now he's moved on to open other restaurants. He's still in the game. Love seeing him. Love hugging him. Love having a bourbon. Talking about what we're doing. That's, that's got to be it for me. How, how old is Jonathan? He is probably around 48. I want to say he's eight years older than me. He was like 23 or 24 when I started working for him, and I was like 15. Wow. So y'all kind of grew up together in a sense. A little bit, yeah. I mean, I, the difference I, between fifteen and twenty and twenty three is a lot different than the difference between forty and forty eight. We're getting like closer in age now, uh, yeah. that, now that I'm getting older. I know that's. I was kind of thinking about that because it's when you were describing him, I was like, "Was oh, this guy sixty? But you know, you don't hear about you know, is he twenty years ahead of you or or, right. or not? But that's it is interesting because I feel like they're this in chef years. And it's like dog years or something. <laughs> it's like, it definitely tends to be a young man's game. Yeah. And you hear about the knees after. So, all right. Biggest misconception about your job, Amanda. Like, you've seen the memes, what I do, what people think I do. You know, with what, what does somebody think you do that is something that you're like, no, that's not what we do on our farm? That's a tough one. I think the biggest thing is how people don't think that we really care for our animals and that we really care about what we do and that, you know, it doesn't really come back to a family farm. I think that's the biggest kind of misconception where, um, you know, we're doing everything that we can to make sure that we're providing a healthy, safe and nutritious source. But it's hard because you have all the, the slander going around and affecting our industry where it's all just families trying to do the best. Yeah. 
I want to blow up that a little bit more because what's so crazy to me, and I, I don't know how you you tell this any better, but like literally, you're selling something by the pound. So the healthier and better it's doing, the more money you you have every not just morally an incentive to take care of like okay well, you have a financial incentive you have a financial incentive like it literally is everything to provide a big juicy healthy cow at the end of the gate of course yeah and people don't realize you know during calving season it might be 10 degrees outside five degrees outside three o'clock in the morning but guess what we're still out there checking making sure things haven't calved yet, if things need to come in the barn or needs assistance, you know, it's a no quitting game, kind of like the chefs, you know, you just do what you have to do and, you know, take care of it. That's a neat thing that I've seen on on Instagram. You, you folks listening should always go find some cattle farmers and watch in the spring and the fall because there'll be all these calf pictures all the time. And it's, you know, especially like out West, you'll see them like, you know, they're it's snowy or whatever, and they're they're, you know, getting the calves and mom's barns. It's amazing. All right, biggest misconception, Johnny, about what you do as a chef. Justin can probably agree. Uh, sometimes people just think we pull rabbits out of hats back there, and you know they have, you know, because you, you come in, you you order, and you get a plate of food, and you're gone. But you know, I, I think, and you know, people are learning more and more. And people are getting a better understanding. But, yeah, I think people just really don't realize what it takes to put that really delicious plate of food in front of you, you know. And and how many painstaking hours and, and time, you how much time you've spent in the kitchen, you know, seeking out chefs to, to learn all these things from. And, you know, it's just years and years of stuff. And, uh, you know takes a lot i think it was uh kind of piggybacking on what you were saying i think it was really the day i saw a a a line cook get a box of potatoes and start peeling like just prepping yeah and that was his job for french fries (laughs) yeah Yeah. i mean and that like peeling or or yeah or cutting them for french fries and it's just like over and over and over and that's before anybody walks in the door there's all the prep and all, I mean, mm-hmm. Justin was able to whip up lunch, not just because he's a ma- magician, but because he had some of those smoky Gouda juiciness in the, in the <laughs> fridge that he whipped out. I mean, you know, like there's all the prep and people just think yeah. you just, yeah, they, I on. think cut the, the microwave uh, on. And I think of the French fry is a great example. Like when I was at uh, lockbox or 21 C it's like we would, after we cut them, we would, rinse them in fresh water three times, poach them in a uh, specific salt, vinegar, water, bath, 170 degrees, X amount of time, pull them out, flash fry them, 325 degrees, 90 seconds, lay them flat on a sheet tray, freeze them, drop them from a frozen state into the fryer. You know, that's for a damn French fry. <laughs> yeah. And we wonder why when we just like, chop up some potatoes and throw them in oil it, it doesn't quite do it you it's know, not it's the like, same yeah you're like <laughs> why are my why are my home taters not doing that what about you justin cooking is cool <laughs> <laughs> first of all it's way more than cooking and it's not that cool it's real hard that being said i would have never started if it wasn't for that misunderstanding i started because i thought it was cool It took a whole lot of years and a whole lot of sweat before I found the cool part. Yeah. Did you, I mean, did you have like something that kind of turned on in your brain that was like, oh, I want to do this because, you know, all the chicks love a cook or was it, (laughs) Um, was it just an opportunity that you just said, well, okay. And then, then you fell in love with it. I had a single mom. As soon as I was old enough to be trusted to be at home by myself, I was. So I rode the bus home from school, and I was usually home by myself, playing with the neighborhood kids, running around like a heathen. But I started cooking at a really early age. There was never a thought in my mind that I was going to do something else. Looking back as a child, I can't remember ever thinking, I want to be a doctor or a fireman. Or no, There was only one thing in my mind that I knew I wanted to do. I started having dinner ready for my mom when I was 
10, she'd come home from work and dinner was ready. So I don't know. I can't really put my finger on there being just a time that it started to click for me. I knew as soon as I was old enough to start working in restaurants, I was going to land somewhere. And so that would, and so you'd been cooking a lot by the time you were 15. Yeah. And then rolled into that. Yeah. But when I got my dishwashing job, when I was 15, I was moved up almost immediately because I already was great with a knife. I didn't know techniques at that point, but I already knew how to hit the ground running. Did you have your own knives at that point? I did. Mm-hmm. It was my mom's. I stole it. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of all the, all the heathen things you stole from your, from your mother. If you could have dinner with any three people, living or dead, all throughout history or through your roll the decks, who, who would you invite to dinner? I have to go first. I've got to give Justin time to think. That's what we, we were trying to. We were trying <laughs> he to do got that. time to think the last time. <laughs> and look how like, good he did. He's, he's killing it. One would be my granny because she's one. She is a, an old school cook. She'd go out there in the backyard, grab a chicken, bring it by its neck. Now my mamma, she was more of a cutter, but granny was a, a ringer, and she'd have fried chicken and everything made up for all the workers and everything in ten minutes. She, she was a heck of a woman. That would be one. Secondly, I've always admired this story in the Bible, but I think Ruth would be really cool, you know, to yeah. meet and how she followed Boaz around and how she, you know, would glean and, you know, say honest and true. And her story is really cool and empowering. And then thirdly, you're really making me think well, here. I, we can let you let you go yeah, with two if we do. need to. All right, what you what you got, Johnny? You've had time to think now, so you should be able to rattle off. Um, <laughs> love to share another meal with the with both the grandmas. They were definitely huge inspirations. But for this particular question, I'm going to go Barack Obama, BB King, John Prine. Oh, that's quite a lineup. You think John Prine would sing "Angel from Montgomery" like at dinner? Maybe. If you if you put a good enough meatloaf in front of them, Justin has good meatloaf. There you go. And BB King, I don't know if you know this, but he's from uh, Indianola, Mississippi, not far from where I grew up. So he's uh, he's got a whole museum, and he's one of my first CDs I ever heard. There was a there was a it was a BB King CD back when those were a thing. And uh, there was a song, Nobody Loved Me But My Mama. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, That's that, is, that is blues right there. <laughs> All right, Justin, three people. Grandma has to be on there. Kind of the same as you were saying. It's, uh, it's kind of where I got my first spark for cooking. That's why I use the mismatched china and have all the old antique baking dishes and think about it on a regular basis. You have to have a musician in there. I gotta go with Willie Nelson. And just because I'm a chef, I have to have Anthony Bourdain on there. I wouldn't have said that if he was still with us, but losing him, yeah, I'd sit down and have dinner with him. Yeah, very, very good, good answers there. I've heard, uh, I've heard Bourdain a couple of times, but I've, I've never gotten Obama, BB King, and John Prine. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a lot right there. What do you do to uh, to to unwind? You know, everybody's talking about it, how hard you work, how few days off you have. What, what do you do to unplug? I'll garden, which maybe isn't really <laughs> unwinding or unplugging, but I love growing flowers and vegetables and um, canning them, which is also more work and more time spent. Heck, I have five dozen years of corn sitting in my kitchen needing to be, you know, frozen right now, but. I like to do that or just even relax, grill out, have some people over, and just try to unwind as much as you can. How about you, Johnny? What do you do to shut it down? Hang out with the kids, wrestle with the boys, listen to music, especially this time of year, just hang out in my garden. You know, it's hard for my wife to, she'll, you know, she'll say, do you you, you want to watch another episode of, you know, whatever? And I'll be like, yeah, I'm just going to go pull weeds. And it's like an hour later, and she's like, well, okay, I guess it's too late to watch that now because I've been in your garden all night. But, yeah, love the artistic aspect of gardening, you know, just being able to 
change it around and you know do what you want to do and what all do you have in your garden right now got it every herb under the sun i mean which uh comes in handy got a bunch of greens i've got a great salad mix going that's got you know mustard greens mizuna kale arugula bib butter lettuce all that good stuff tomatoes still hanging on to a few radishes and lots of flowers I like to do the zinnias sunflowers I yeah. saw that field of sunflowers we're driving over here. I was like, <laughs> I should, you know, go take a pic. We just don't see that very often. That's amazing. All right, Justin. Uh, family, for sure. Um, I missed out on so much of it in my 20s and my 30s. It was literally only work. Not much has changed, but as you were saying, I, I don't really ever leave home. When we bought this building, we bought the house next door. And if it wasn't for that, it'd be it'd be pretty tough on me and my family. But just to be able to get home, even if it's just for five minutes to go put my little one down for a nap or whatever. Yeah, that's but, a great reset button. Right. Even just quick little quick little you know, looks into what's going on in my in my family's life while I'm just right next door. My son is getting to the age now that he's playing tons of sports. You know, he's made the all-star baseball teams. We're traveling the state and going to tournaments. And now he's getting ready to start select soccer and tackle football. And mom takes care of most of those practices. I still miss out on things that I wish I didn't, but I make time to make games and just go go into the park across the street, throwing ball and, you know, dad stuff. That's, that's definitely it. I wanted to just say drink bourbon, but it's not responsible. I decided I'd leave with something a little more loving. <laughs> Sometimes you can do some of that with, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to split hairs over here. So, Amanda, Reed gets a phone call, and he hears that you've been arrested. What does he think you did? Speeding. Speeding. Yes. That bad, huh? Well, you see, I kind of, my brother in law is a sheriff here, so I feel like I have a, I'm good if I get pulled over by the sheriff's department, but Georgetown PD, I don't have it out with, so I need to work on that connection. Just keep some stakes in the back? Yeah, just in case, you know, always a good excuse. I was trying to get them home before they thawed. <laughs> <laughs> it's a legit story. My wife could think of a lot of things. But first and foremost, probably stealing something. Justin, you might want to double check all your silverware <laughs> after we leave. Now, just kidding. Uh, yeah, probably probably larceny. Larceny. Shoot, we. I'm kind of with you. My wife with so many things that go through her brain. The first anything. thing we say is, "Who are you with?" If I wasn't with anyone, she'd probably think I just lost it and strangled somebody. I don't know. <laughs> There's, there's so much anger in there sometimes. If she said, oh, you're with Phil, then that's a whole different category. That's a whole different thing. Yeah. yeah. Whatever we did, we're going down together. There you go. All right. So I got one other question. So what's your favorite beverage to have with your, your steak? I mean, I love a good glass of red wine. There's nothing better than beef and wine. I'm going to have to agree. Yeah, same. All right. So... One year from today, we we crack open a, a great bottle of wine, a bunch of flank steaks or ribeyes or whatever. What are we celebrating that happened with with Halstead? I'd say just another year of good markets, good business, selling more beef to local, you know, customers, and continuing to get our beef story out there. Johnny, just expanding the business getting so busy that I've got to get more cooks and more servers and that'll be great. Continued growth? Continued growth. We're actually looking at expanding into some other buildings and some other opportunities so a year from now local feed will be bigger than it is now. There you go. You've got some very exciting plans that uh, folks, if you're coming near Georgetown, you're, you're going to need to find out what's happening on the block with local feed, because mm-hmm. uh, regardless of when you hear this, there, there's something going on, 
and Justin's got big plans, and he's. I think you've made a, a tremendous mark in this town with you know what you what you're doing and and the food that you're preparing, and I think culinarily educating folks just by virtue of you sharing different dishes and different specials and um, appreciate that. Well, does anybody have any any last thoughts that we need to need to get out between farming and chefing and beef and grandma's chicken and anything you feel like you you didn't say? I definitely touched on this, but I mean, I just think it's so it's just so important for a chef to build that relationship with the farmer whether it's you know, beef or the guy you get your garlic from. I mean, it just makes such a difference throughout the whole process of uh, getting it in and preparing it, and respecting it in, in every aspect. And, you know, that, that makes you better at, you know, being less wasteful. And then if you can be in the position where you can, you know, instill those things in the younger generation, then that's a win for sure. Yeah, tremendous. I want to encourage our listeners to uh, to definitely, you may not know all of your ingredients, where they come from, but you want to find somebody that you can have a relationship with in your supply chain and really get to know them and figure out how to help them grow their business. Because that's the, you know, we've talked about this on other beef podcasts. Like if you as a chef only want to buy ribeyes from a local farm, that doesn't help them grow their business. And so having that conversation and figuring out, well, oh, so if you bought more ground beef, I could have more steaks for, you know, those. And that's the same for, I mean, crop farmer, you know, whether growing beets or garlic or whatever, like there's, there's that relationship is what Johnny was talking about. It's really the secret sauce of growing for them to have more opportunities to sell you more things that you can use and making the world go round. So I want to thank everybody for joining us on the podcast. Go around and you'll just tell people how to find you, whether it's social media, websites, so if somebody wants to keep up with you guys. Sure, yeah. You can find us on Facebook or Instagram at Halstead Farms and Meats and our website's halsteadfarmsandmeats.com. You can find us on the gram, like Chef. Lex Chef, that's L E X C H E F? Yes, sir. No underscores, right? No underscores on that? It's just straight up. All right. Instagram, Facebook, Google, type in local feed, you'll find us. Local feed, Georgetown, Kentucky. Well, thank y'all for joining us on the podcast. Caitlin, thanks for helping put all this together. And the Kentucky Beef Council, it's been a tremendous day. I've, I've had, a, had a great time here in Kentucky. And uh, Justin, dude. Thank you for hosting this portion and for cooking. Absolutely. Um, It's always great to see you. Dang good lunch, man. Dang good lunch. Thank you, sir. You've been listening to the Eat Y'all podcast, hosted by Eat Y'all founder and chief relationship officer, Andy Chapman. If you enjoyed this episode, it would mean the world to us if you'd join us in our mission to save family farms by subscribing and leaving a review. Even better, share this episode and follow us on your favorite social media account at Let's Eat Y'all 